self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to, and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this world. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Hello, good evening everybody. Uh, I'm glad you're here with us on a Saturday evening. My name is Annemarijn Epker and I am a program editor here at the Bali. And tonight I will be your moderator. I am really happy and honored that we have a very special guest in our midst tonight. His name is George Monbiot, and um, we will speak with him about how we're currently destroying the world. We are destroying uh, our natural environment, plants and species are threatened with extinction, and our uh, democratic institutions are not working well anymore. Um, at the same time, solidarity is under pressure, while inequality, hate and violence are on the rise. So I'm really uh, happy that George is here with us tonight, also to give us some hope. Um, and um, I have been uh, trying to invite him to the Bali already for more than a year, uh, because I think that he has a really important story to tell to you. Um, I'm happy he could make it in the end because he had a really busy schedule. He has been in Rotterdam in Armenia this afternoon uh, and he just arrived from the big brainwash festival um, uh, also in Amsterdam. So I'm super glad you could make it here at the end of the day uh, and I'm happy you're here finally. Um, I wanted to welcome also the people who are watching tonight's live stream. Um, I'm really glad that you're spending your Saturday evening uh, with us instead of partying, trying to make the world a little bit of a better place. So, uh, George Monbiot is a zoologist from origin. He is a, a versatile journalist, political and environmental activist. And besides, he wrote many uh, best-selling books, amongst which Feral, Rewilding the Land, Sea and Human Life, and The Age of Consent. By the way, I'm not sure if you know it, uh, and if you noticed it, but George has many more talents which you might not know of yet. I'm not sure, uh, does anyone have an idea about it? The music that you heard while walking into uh, this room is from an album that George made with a friend, Ewan McLennan, um, and it is called Breaking the Spell of Loneliness. After the publication of um, uh, his uh, book, How Did We Get Into This Mess, in 2016, he actually didn't have any other option than to write another book. Um, this time on how we could get out of this mess, of course. So in his latest book, Out of the Wreckage, uh, Monbiot presents a new story, a story for a society based on solidarity, on local communities, and on the politics, uh, politics of belonging. In this book, he tries to come up with a new story, a new narrative that can counter the current dominant neoliberal discourse that we're living in. Um, and actually, my favorite quote from uh, this book, I'm not sure if you read it already, uh, but uh, if you didn't, please do it after this evening. Uh, my uh, favorite quote is, political failure is a failure of imagination. And actually, I would like to take that also as a starting point for our conversation later on this evening. 
Um, so then a little bit more about the setup of this evening. Um, uh, George will give a talk in which he explains his new story for society. Afterwards, uh, I wanted to ask him a few questions, but of course, um, there will also be room for you for the audience. So please uh, write down your questions and I will get back to you after uh, George's talk. Um, but before we really start, I was kind of curious to hear more about who uh, we're having here in the audience. So um, please raise your hand if the following is applicable uh, to you. Um, do we have any students in the room tonight? Please raise your hand if you are a student. So quite some students. Do we have uh, any people who are working for an NGO? Yeah? I'm, I'm, what, what kind of NGO are you working for, if I may ask? Um, I work for a CNA Foundation. It's right. a grant-giving charity. All right. Um, do we have any politicians in the room tonight? Or any policy makers? Okay, I'm getting to you, sorry. <laughs> Could you say your name and your affiliation? I'm Tom van der Lee. I'm a member of parliament for the Green Left Party. All right. Thank you so much for being here with us. Then, are there any people who are uh, trying to set up their own grassroots organization or their own startup? I see a little hand. Ah, here. <laughs> What kind of organization are you? Well, this is extremely uh, grassroots. We're just starting to set up what's called a Bevoners Committee in our neighborhood, which is a way for um, renters to have more power over the uh, uh, housing corporations that they're renting from. Thank you. And what would you like to hear from George tonight? Is there anything in particular you're interested in? Oh, just ways to get traction uh, at the grassroots, which I think is starting to happen in a big way right now and, and is really important. All right. Thank you very much. So, um, George Monbiot, please take the floor. Um, we're very much looking forward to hear your story. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. The question I'm asked, perhaps more than any other, is why don't you despair? And given that my job consists of rolling in the excrement of humanity, it's a good question. After all, there is a lot to despair about. There's the environmental crisis. And one of my recent uncomfortable revelations is that climate breakdown might not even be the fastest and worst thing that's happening at the moment. The complete collapse of biological systems, driven primarily by the food industry, by farming and fishing, is happening even faster than climate breakdown is happening. We have, at the same time, an economic crisis of extreme and growing inequality, not perhaps so much here, certainly in the Anglosphere and many other poorer nations as well, where we have what Thomas Piketty calls the spiral of patrimonial wealth accumulation, where those who are already rich use that wealth in effect to tax people much poorer than themselves through exacting economic rent from them. And in London, there are plenty of people now paying 40 or 50 percent of their income to stay in a grotty flat with water running down the walls and mice scuttling across the floor to people who don't have to work at all. So these people are working and working and working to pay this rent. And other people are saying, thank you very much, we just take it in. And they use that money to then buy more property, exact more rent, and there's no natural break to that process. The rich just get richer and richer, ex extract more and more wealth from the poor, unless government intervenes with very high wealth taxes and the rest of it. But government doesn't intervene because of the third crisis, which is the political crisis where basically governments have stopped governing. 
the self-hating state tears itself apart and rolls itself back and saying, we're no longer in the business of changing social outcomes. And the um, reason for this is that we are powerfully dominated by an ideology called neoliberalism which um, was formulated by thinkers such as um, Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, um, but then massively funded by some of the richest people on earth, setting up academic departments, think tanks, newspapers, um, getting advisors into government, until it becomes so familiar to us that we can scarcely imagine the world in any other state. And what neoliberalism says is... Um, it is invalid to interfere in the workings of what it calls the market, which is basically what wealthy people do. Because um, the free market, leaving wealthy people free from democracy, in other words, um, that the free market it will deliver everything that society needs, it will solve all our problems, it will generate wealth, and above all, most importantly, it will discover the natural hierarchy of winners and losers, the deserving rich and the undeserving poor. And if you tax the rich or regulate them or trade unions engage in collective bargaining, then you disrupt the discovery of that hierarchy and the wrong people might come out on top. The undeserving people might come out on top. This is, I mean, it sounds bizarre, but this is really what they believe, especially in Hayek's Constitution of Liberty. If you can wade through this book, you'll discover it's completely mad. But, but this has become the dominant doctrine of our age. And, and so politics becomes incapable of solving our problems because even politics itself is delegitimized. It's not supposed to operate. There's not supposed to be political engagement in the great problems of the day. In fact, they're not even recognized as structural problems in the first place. So you can't address the environmental crisis because that requires massive government intervention. You can't address the mental health crisis. You can't address the, 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 the economic crisis above all else because that actually requires um, knocking the very rich people off their perch and redistributing a lot of their money. Um, and so we um, face not only that system, but also the reaction to that system. Because for years, there's been this political consensus around neoliberalism, which means that things don't change, except perhaps get worse. And people don't see politics delivering for them, because it's uh, engineered now not to change social outcomes. So politics becomes a remote business of an elite talking above our heads, and it's irrelevant to our lives. So we look elsewhere for answers. And along come people who say, hey, I'm outside that system. I'm anti-politics. I, I don't have any truck with that liberal elite. I'm going to give you slogans and sensation instead of argument and facts. And I'm going to make you proud of your country. I'm going to make this country great again, even if the hats are made in China. Um, and and we, we then find ourselves orienting towards these uh, demagogic populists who have filled the gap that politics has left. It's basically people like Trump and Modi and Bolsonaro and Erdogan and Orban and um, Duterte are the result of neoliberalism. They might not be neoliberals themselves, they are the reaction to neoliberalism. And it gets still worse. I mean, Bolsonaro, if he wins uh, in the second round in Brazil tomorrow, we will see an actual fascist elected to the presidency of a very large nation. And fascism, it's almost unbelievable to say it. 20 years ago, no one could have conceived that this would possibly be the case, is on the march again across the world, including through Europe. It's just incredible when you stand back, think how could this possibly be happening? But it's happening because there is a political vacuum that hasn't been filled by mainstream politics. So we've got a problem, 
a series of problems, interlocking problems. Why don't I despair about this? And the reason I don't despair is the reason that Anne Marine mentioned, which is my belief that political failure is at heart a failure of imagination. If you are staring at the wall that confronts you and you are not seeing the cracks in that wall, it's not because there are no cracks in the wall. Every political edifice is riddled with cracks. It's because you're not looking at it right. You need to stand back, look at it from a different angle, in a different light, and you will see that there are cracks. And this conviction has been reinforced for me by four observations. Not, not all of them original, um, varying degrees to which they're interesting, but I'll share them with you anyway. The first one is perhaps the most commonplace, but still worth, I think, discussing. And this is that it is not political leaders or political parties so much who create major political change, but big political stories. John Maynard Keynes sat down in response to the Great Depression and um, wrote his general theory. And within 10 years, it had become political common sense across the political spectrum. Whether you were Democrat, Republican, Labour, Conservative, regardless of your political history, your political colour, your political claims, you were, in the words of Richard Nixon, we are all Keynesians now. If you weren't a Keynesian, you had a lot of explaining to do. It just became what politics was. It was far more powerful, the story he told in the general theory, than anyone's actual political loyalties and affiliations. And when that fell apart in the late 1970s, the neoliberals stepped up with this doctrine they'd spent 30 years developing um, and said, hey, we've got this new story. Um, where we're going to solve all these problems that Keynesianism has created. And within about 10 years, everyone became a neoliberal. Labour in Britain became a neoliberal party alongside the Conservatives. Bill Clinton's Democrats, the same. Um, it, it, uh, we, everyone fell into line with this new political common sense. The story conquered all. And perhaps this is unsurprising because we are creatures of narrative. When we try to make sense of the world, the sense we seek is not the sense that a mathematician or a scientist or a philosopher would um, see as sense. It's something entirely different. And the reason we don't use the reason which um, mathematicians and scientists and philosophers recognize to try and interpret the world is that our brains are simply not big enough. There is so much data coming at us. We live in such a complex world. Even during the early stages of human evolution, when we first got onto two legs, the world was tremendously complex because ecology is tremendously complex. The mind even then was tremendously complex. Other people's minds were tremendously complex. So you can't say, right, there's this stream of data coming from here and this one from there and this one from there. Let's um, do an empirical analysis of this data and work out what this is telling us about the world and what the objective facts are. You just, we don't have the processing capacity all the time to do that. We would do nothing if we tried to live like that. Instead, we seek shortcuts. And the shortcuts we seek are stories. And some of the uh, narrative structures go back tens of thousands of years, as far as we know, um, if we interpret correctly some of the cultures which, which, which were studied from pre-literate times. Um, and, they, and, and they fall into um, a certain number of categories. I mean, people say there are three basic plots, or five basic plots, or seven basic plots, or nine basic plots. It's always an odd number for some reason, but uh, however many basic plots there are, there are certain narrative structures that we look out for to make sense of the world. And we're listening for those to see, where am I? Who am I? Well, how did I get to where I am? What does the future hold for me? We're listening for a coherent story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, which is going to tell that to us, the shortcut which, which gives a rough approximation of where we stand. Very important for us to know, and, and we sort of have this yearning, this sort of discomfort if we don't have a, a story which makes sense 
of the world for us. Um, and as a result, you can't confront a story with facts and figures. They just bounce off. As I found during the climate wars, where I sort of spent three years arguing with climate change deniers who were saying, oh, it's all rubbish, it's man-made climate change thing, it's a giant conspiracy created by climate scientists who are just lining their own pockets because we all know that the only reason to become a climate scientist is to make tons of money. Um, and, and, it's a, and the governments want to tax us, so they've invented this thing. And you say, well, that's not true because here are the facts and here are the figures, and all you get is angry denial. It doesn't get you anywhere at all. The only thing that can replace a story is a story. You cannot take away someone's story without giving them a new one. The second observation is more interesting. And this is that those two big stories I mentioned before, Keynesian social democracy and neoliberalism, which are radically opposed to each other, diametrically opposed to each other, have exactly the same narrative structure. It is one of those basic plots, one of how many, I won't say, but one of those basic plots that I call the restoration story. And this is a story you've all heard hundreds of times. It's Lord of the Rings story. It's the Narnia story. It's the Harry Potter story. It's the Bible story. And it goes like this. Disorder afflicts the land caused by powerful and nefarious forces working against the interests of humanity. But the hero, who might be one person or a group of people, confronts those powerful and nefarious forces against the odds, overthrows them, and restores order to the land. This is a very familiar narrative structure, isn't it? You've uh, seen the thousand films, you've read a thousand books with this narrative structure. And when you look at what John Maynard Keynes did with the general theory, his story went like this. Disorder afflicts the land, caused by the powerful and nefarious forces of the economic elite who gathered up all the money for themselves during the laissez-faire era, gra grabbing the dragon's hoard, which they then sat on and prevented anyone else from getting, and in doing so deprived other people of wealth, um, starved the um, economy of consumer power, um, uh, forced people into debt and unemployment, which coalesced into the Great Depression with its disastrous consequences. But the hero of the story, the enabling state supported by the working and middle classes, confronts those powerful and nefarious forces. And by taxing them, and by spending that money in the form of public services, it creates effective demand, stimulating consumption, which in turn stimulates employment, and against the odds, creates a virtuous circle which restores order to the land. That's Keynesian social democracy, the story that Lord Keynes told. The neoliberal story goes as follows. You'll never guess how it starts. <laughs> Disorder afflicts the land, caused by the powerful and nefarious force of the collectivizing state. By taxing the rich, by redistributing their money, it makes everyone the same. And though it may seem benign in its early stages, such as in the European welfare states and the US New Deal, it leads inexorably down the road to serfdom, towards totalitarianism, crushing the humanity out of us. But... The freedom-seeking entrepreneur, buying and spending in the market, creates the space in which the state is rolled back. And gradually, by expanding his economic activities and curtailing state power, he spreads freedom and opportunity and individualism across the land uh, against the odds, restoring order to the land two profoundly opposed and opposite stories with exactly the same narrative structure. Which leads to the third, more interesting observation. 
which is that when you look at just about every successful political or religious transformation there has ever been, they use exactly the same restoration story as their narrative structure, which is central to those transformations. And this leads to the fourth observation, which is the reason we are still stuck with neoliberalism, despite its political, intellectual, economic, social bankruptcy, as revealed in 2008 when the whole system came crashing round their ears and even Alan Greenspan, the uber neoliberal, was forced to admit there is a flaw in the system. The reason why we're still stuck with it is we have produced no new restoration story with which to replace it. Keynes responded to the Great Depression, here's your new story. Neoliberals responded to the collapse of Keynesianism, here's your new story. 2008 neoliberalism collapse and we come forward with... Um, uh, well, uh, well, um, well, maybe, um, hmm, uh, perhaps a little less neoliberalism. Oh, no, 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 more neoliberalism. It didn't go far enough. Oh, well, we uh, don't really know what to do. We just um, stop doing the bad stuff. That was the most we came up with, really, stop doing the bad stuff. You know, even the wonderful Occupy movement, you know, said, well, we're just going to oppose the bad stuff. We're not going to um, propose um, a, a, a new world of our own and opposing is enough, but it's, it's not. Even proposing is not enough unless it's embedded with a narrative framework which is going to tell people where they stand. So all we need is a new restoration story which tells us who we are, how we got here, where we stand today, that lights a path to a better future that has a beginning, a middle and an end and inspires people to come together and change the world. Bit of a tall order, perhaps. Oh, and incidentally, is based in fact and reality rather than in the total bullshit which neoliberalism was built around. So this does sound a little bit tough, but I believe there is such a story waiting to be told. <clears throat> and it goes a bit like this. Disorder affects the land. <laughs> Caused by the powerful and nefarious forces of the neoliberal billionaires and the think tanks and the economists and the politicians and the journalists who they've sponsored, who tell us that we are and should be a part, that we are fundamentally selfish and greedy and we've got no good qualities, but in fact those are good qualities because we can use them to build a world of their choosing and in doing so split us up, atomize and rule. But we, the heroes of the story, will confront those powerful and nefarious forces. And by building political community, embedded in neighborhood community, embedded in a participatory culture, create a politics of belonging, deep-rooted, steadfast, generous, inclusive, and compassionate. And in doing so, we restore order to the land. Incidentally, heroism, steadfastness, steadfastness, compassion. Does anyone recognize those three values? Three crosses of Amsterdam. By pure coincidence. Or maybe not. <laughs> Perhaps it's going to start here. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, this might need a little bit of unpacking, I think because at the moment I haven't told you very much yet about this. Now, we have a limited amount of time, so what I'm going to do is to just sketch out a few examples of what this politics of belonging, this restoration story, could look like in practice. And I think it starts, not necessarily chronologically, because I think all these different things can happen, should happen at the same time, and Lord knows we haven't got much time, um, but um, I, I, I would like to start the story at any rate with the building of a participatory culture at the neighbourhood level. And I'm not saying that this solves all our problems by itself, I'm saying it's one important component, but its importance is as a seedbed, um, as a soil in which the other stuff can put down deep roots. 
Because without the long-lasting community, the participatory culture, the other things we do are easily uprooted and, and torn down by the forces who might oppose us. And the other thing, you know, the thing I, I really like about this approach is that every single thing I'm going to suggest is a good thing in its own right. You can say to yourself, yeah, well, I created a participatory culture, brought people together who were previously lonely, and we've been having a wild party ever since, and we've been doing lots of good things for the neighborhood, and, um, you know, it's a much more thriving and amazing place than it was before, but hey, we didn't change the world, so what a waste that was. Yeah. All these steps are good steps. You know, it's not about means and ends. Oh, we have to do lots of nasty stuff in order to get to this promised land. No, everything we do is part of the promised land. It, it builds the world that we want to see, even in its initial stages. And of course, lots of people are already working towards this. But we, we have almost a science now of how to build a participatory culture. Um, in fact, there's a great big <clears throat> report, 400-page report, published by um, community organizers in Britain, looking around the world at really good examples of how to do it. One of the ones, incidentally, they highlighted was the Les Halles in, in Rotterdam, which I went to visit today. Um, this community library, which has proliferated into loads of other community projects. Very successful, really inspiring people. Oh, I, I was blown away by what I saw and what they told me today, um, where, where just loads of stuff has sprung from this project. So how, why is it that projects like that are successful while others are less successful? And so the, they did this sort of empirical study of this and found that there are several features. One <clears throat> is that you need a mixture of initiatives, some of which are very specialist you have people who do deep dives into something very particular, very specialist, but might be important for the community, but very few people are going to participate, but those people will participate with a lot of their time and energy. At the same time, you need what they call low commitment, low threshold activities. Things which are very easy to wander into, wander out again. There's no great fear of sort of getting over this high threshold, all that sort of thing's not for me, it's all a bit weird and a bit scary. Just simple things things which immediately meet people's needs, such as shared childcare, um, shared bulk buying so you can buy food and stuff much cheaper, shared cooking and eating, you know, teaching cooking skills, but at the same time being able to eat together. It's a fundamental. How many people here know the origin of the word companion? Anyone? Yeah, well, a couple. Very good. Right. It's um, a Latin word. It's um, from the words companes, with bread. Eating together is fundamental to fellowship. And what do we do? We sit in front of the telly with a microwave meal going <laughs> like this. Uh, you know, bringing people together to eat is, is a really important community activity, but it's also a really simple thing. And when you say, okay, the whole street on this day of the year, we're going to close it off, we're going to put tables down the street, uh, we're going to bring out the beer, we're going to um, sit, sit and eat together, that's when you meet neighbors you never knew you had. And other stuff comes from, oh, you do this? Really? I'm really interested in that. You know, and things then kick off from there. Um, and so you have a lot of that stuff. And what this study showed, looking at examples like the Les Halles, uh, was that um, once you reach about 10 to 15 percent of the population who engage at some level with community projects, you get this sudden takeoff and it becomes the norm. It becomes a normal thing to be involved in a community project and a bit weird not to be involved. So the opposite of what prevails in most cases today. So um, that's uh, very briefly sort of step one is to sort of have vibrant neighborhoods building community on a generous and inclusive basis. And you might say, well, that's all very nice, but yeah, do we really need this as part of our political transformation? And I think absolutely we do. And the reason for this is that these two words, community and belonging, are about the only words which are shared value, describe shared values across the political spectrum. There is almost no one in any political party who doesn't like the words community and belonging. They might mean slightly different things by them, but at least we have a shared language. 
so we can talk the same language. And now that so many people are floating voters and their political affiliations change all the time, we have to talk to everybody. We have to find a language in common. But the reason why these are shared values is that they are like food and drink. We need community and belonging. They are absolutely essential to our well-being. We stand together or we fall apart psychologically. We can't cope with, with, with isolation. There's some fascinating work which uh, Ewan and I researched um, when we were writing the album, which is called Breaking the Spell of Loneliness, so we wanted to find out why loneliness hurts us so much, um, about the huge range of physical diseases uh, which chronic loneliness can cause, quite aside from all the, 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 the mental disorders, uh, mental health disorders. Um, it's very, very bad for us indeed. And the reason for this is that we are the uber social mammal, with the possible exception of the naked mole rat. Um, we, we are more sociable and more community minded than any other mammal we know. We are more altruistic and more empathetic than any other animal that's ever been studied. It is quite a remarkable thing. We have a wholly mistaken view of our own psychology. We believe we're primarily selfish and greedy. We've all got a little bit of that in us, but it's way down the list of values in terms of, of, of what most people are. Not on the whole, those who claim to lead us. Um, broadly speaking, we are a community of altruists governed by psychopaths. Um, and, and somehow we, let, we keep letting this happen. I mean, basically, if you're a psychopath and you're born poor, you go to prison. If you're a psychopath and you're born rich, you go to business school. Um, and, um, uh, and, and actually, the, I, I'm, I'm being flippant, but actually the science does bear that out. And it really does bear that out. It's quite remarkable, consistent results of uh, this sort of showing how psychopathy works in different classes. Um, and, you know, there's a 1% of the population roughly, though it's a bit of a spectrum. Uh, highly atypical values, but those with highly atypical values often come to dominate um, those with typical values. Um, and, and so, but the great majority of us um, absolutely need community and belonging. This is why solitary confinement is such an effective form of torture. You can't form a mind without other people's minds. And if we don't provide an inclusive, generous, compassionate, steadfast, heroic community and belonging, other people will provide a very different kind of community and a very different kind of belonging, which can be extremely cruel and exclusive. Because what does fascism offer if it's not community and belonging? This is an extreme coherence that fascism offers. You wear the same uniforms, you wear the same armbands, you march to the same music, if you can call it music. You claim to belong to the same race, the same ethnicity. You, you are claiming an extreme coherence. And as Hannah Arendt pointed out, fascism arises from the atomization of society. It is lonely people who are drawn into fascist movements. The alternative to generous and inclusive community and belonging is not no community or no belonging because we can't cope with that. It's a very different and potentially very nasty form of community and belonging. So we've got to get in there before the fascists fill the vacuum. <clears throat> so that's sort of step one or one of the steps because they're not in any particular order. <clears throat> But it's, of course, by no means enough to affect the political transformation. So another step is to create a genuine participatory democracy. Also community, because every step I'm talking about is about building community, but there's some different kinds of interlocking communities that we're building. And I'm not against representative democracy. I'm against only having representative democracy. Because, frankly, it is ridiculous. You have a political leader, politician A, who says, well, you elected me so I can do this. And I say, well, actually, I didn't vote for you. But, yeah, some people did. But that was four years ago. And none of them were thinking of this when they voted for you. Because there were 192 items on your manifesto, which no one read anyway. 
and they all voted because of something economic or because of immigration or crime or something, which had nothing to do with this new airport runway, which you say you got a democratic mandate for, because four years ago some people put a cross on a piece of paper for something completely different. Oh, and by the way, I've just checked, and that wasn't even in the manifesto. I mean, it's preposterous, this notion that you have this assumed consent for anything you want to do because once upon a time some people voted for you. That's not democracy. So what we need to do is to temper representative democracy with genuine participatory democracy. And there are some wonderful examples around the world. And I think possibly the best one is uh, the program called Better Reykjavik, where um, the uh, uh, Icelanders, having had a catastrophic experience in the financial crisis, we all know what happened, the banks collapsed completely, it um, exposed the total falsehoods on which the Icelandic economy had been built. They said, we're going to do something completely different here. And in Reykjavik, you've got this system whereby anyone can propose an idea for the city's improvement. And then all the rest of the population can vote on that idea. And every month, um, you, you vote on the ideas which have been put forward, and the top ones, the ones which come to top in the ballot, are then passed to the council. And the council either has to accept the ideas or produce a very good reason for rejecting them. And they have to sort of do the research and say, well, yeah, you know, we like the sound of this, but actually we've come up with this problem and that problem. And we think on balance it's not a good idea to adopt this. And it turns out that those very good reasons are absolutely essential to people's trust in the system. Because it's when politicians dismiss you out of hand and just say, oh, sod off, what a ridiculous person you are, that people just lose faith. In, in politics, but it's when they engage seriously with what you're saying that people think, yeah, this is worth being involved with. And as a result, and this is really quite remarkable, you know, when we're, you know, we're told all this about, oh, people don't care about politics, two thirds of the population of Reykjavik have, have been actively engaged in this participatory system as, as full participants in it. That's a, a really extraordinary thing. So that's one example of this, and there are many, many others, all different kinds. It's very cleverly done, nice example of, of how you can temper uh, representative democracy because you have the council, you still have the representatives with participatory democracy. But it's, again, not enough because we also need to have participatory economics. And a wonderful example of this was the thing that was set up, oh, over 20 years ago now, um, 25 years ago, I think, in Porto Alegre, um, the city in the south of Brazil. It's all been a bit trashed now because of the rise of fascist politics and nasty stuff which is going on across Brazil. But for about 20 years, this absolutely transformed the prospects of people in that city, and it's called participatory budgeting. And basically, the people of the city, as a body, set the infrastructure budget. On average, about 50,000 people a year would take part in this budgeting process, including illiterate people, very, very poor people. And there was a really clever design for making sure that everybody had an active and meaningful role in this process that um, you had districts and sub-districts with decisions passed upwards. There were formulas for making sure that wealth went from rich areas to, poor, to poorer areas. And basically, people took control of what had been captured by corruption previously in the city. And the results were extraordinary. Greatly improved primary health care, greatly improved education, sanitation, um, um, clean water, transport, Maternal mortality almost disappeared, infant mortality almost disappeared, all the social indicators just went boom like this. Whereas, you know, other Brazilian cities were still right down here. Porto Alegre had a completely different trajectory. In fact, so successful was this program that something happened that a political scientist would tell you is simply impossible. People demonstrating in the street to have their taxes raised. I kid you not, this is what they're doing. And you think, how can that possibly be true? Well, think about it for a moment. Say you've got a system where it's 
really, really difficult and frustrating to get to work because there isn't any good public transport, the buses don't work, the streets are jammed up. How are you, how are you going to solve your problem? Well, the only thing you can do in that situation if you live a long way from work is to buy yourself a car. You spend $10,000 on getting yourself a car. What happens? You're still stuck in the traffic. Having spent all this money, you haven't solved the problem. And the government comes along and says, um, sorry, mate, but we want $200 from you. So what do you want that for? Because we want to build a rapid mass transit system going across the city. Oh, all right, well, I've got no choice. You're taxing me, so I have to give you the money, so you, $200. But because this is a proper accountable system and that money actually does get spent on what they say, they build a mass transit system, and you're getting to work in one-third of the time that you were previously getting to work. Boom, just like that. That's fantastic. And it's cost you $200, not $10,000. So actually taking the money out of your pocket and giving it to the government, your money goes a lot further than if you kept it for yourself. It's a perfect, even in neoclassical economic terms, this is a perfectly rational decision to make under those circumstances. But that's still not enough. We need another element because if we retain a situation where a tiny handful of people keep hold of all that wealth that they have accumulated and use it to tax the rest of society, well, they retain a tremendous amount of power, uh, political power that goes with that economic power, and they can stymie and frustrate a lot of the other things that what we want to do. So again, in the name of building community, but also in solving our existing problems, I want to see a major transfer of wealth from the private sector into the commons. How many people here would comfortably define the commons? Feel confident about that. One, two hands, three, four, five, six. Oh, this is pretty good. Much better than the average British audience. The average is zero, maybe 0 0.1. Point one be the person who's going mm, like that. Um, but um, yeah, th thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad some people know it. But it is an amazing thing. The Commons was once the major economic sector, the biggest economic sector of all. But today, most people haven't even heard of it. When we position ourselves politically, we tend to do so along a single axis, which has got the market at one end and the state at the other. And if you um, tend towards the left, you say, I want more state and less market. And if you're on the right, you say, I want more market and less state. But in doing so, we forget that there are actually four major sectors to the economy. There is the state and the market, and they're both important. There's also the household, which many people call the core economy. Crucially important, because without the household, <clears throat> nothing else can function. And because it's so little recognized, by economists, <clears throat> the economic role of women is underestimated because they remain the core household providers. Uh, the lovely book by Catherine Marcel called um, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? And um, she explains that while the great man was writing his wealth of nations and describing the workings of the invisible hand, the invisible hands of his mother were doing all the work. And she was making his bed and ironing his clothes and making his meals and doing all the things without which he would not have been able to function. And yet, he completely failed to see what his poor mum, Margaret Douglas, was doing as he was scribbling away. That part of the economy didn't f feature in his work at all. She really was invisible. So we need to put that right. But... Then there's this fourth sector, the commons, which is perhaps the most neglected of all, to the extent that you know, most people really struggle to define it, even if they've heard of it at all. So I'm going to attempt a definition, <clears throat> which is that the commons consists of three major elements. The first is a resource, which could be a piece of land, it could be a river, it could be a piece of open source software, it could be a web platform. There's all sorts of things it could be. And there's no limit to the imagination as to what it could be. Community broadband, how, how, uh, community land trust, whatever it might be. There's loads and loads of different things. And um, uh, the second element is the community 
that manages and controls that resource. It's not everyone who manages and controls it, it's a particular community of people. And the third element is the rules and negotiations that that community creates in order to manage and control that resource successfully. It's not the market, it's not the state. It exists in its own category. It's neither capitalist nor communist, it's something else entirely. And typically, a common resource is inalienable. It can't be sold, it can't be given away. And uh, either the resource itself or the product from that resource are shared equally among the members of the community. And this means that a commons is inherently more sustainable than either the state or the market, because it's always looking towards the long-term view of sustaining this resource. It's also inherently more equitable because of, of the division of, of the resource or, or the product, which is, which is implicit in that. Now, I'm very ambitious about expanding the commons, and the sort of idea that I'm interested in, and there's you know, a lot of work to be done, and in fact with a group of people um, at home I'm doing um, some work which I hope could be very interesting in showing how it can be done, but crudely put, for example, you could say, we want to transfer prime urban real estate out of the hands of the oligarchs who now own so much of it. Uh, and you know, this is the greatest source of wealth inequality is, 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 is real estate, is property. Um, and, and this is something they never made, that land, the value was given by all of society and yet they're scooping it and charging the rest of us rent to use this thing which you know, they never made. It's just this land, it's there, it was there before they were there. Unless you're in Holland, obviously, it's a little bit different in this case. You made it, okay, that's, maybe this isn't a good way of putting it in this country, but anywhere else, no, it's, uh, it, this, is, this, this was nature, not, not human action. And um, so, so you then say, right, let's impose a high rate of land value tax on this thing they never made, but they're making so much money from. That brings down the value of the land, so it becomes um, um, easier to purchase. You then use the revenue you get from that land value tax, distribute it among communities to fund community land trusts, which can then buy land and build their own housing, their own enterprises, their own amenities, uh, their, their own food growing areas, whatever it was that they want, is that they want to do, they then control the destiny of that land for the benefit of all the members of the community. It's just one example of the sort of transfer I would like to see affected. And in every case, as you see, we're building community. It's different sort of ways of coming into community, but we're building it. Slightly different communities often, but they mesh together and they support each other. But it's still not enough, because we also have to act politically at the national level. Because you can do all these wonderful things at the local level, but if you're in a hostile environment, it can all be undone again. You can say, hey, look, we've created this wonderful community land trust, and the government says, oh, perfect place for a six-lane highway. <laughs> and it just destroy everything you've done. So you need to be in a sympathetic political environment, and that requires regime change. Democratically, of course. <laughs> So how do you do this, given that so few governments anywhere on earth are remotely sympathetic to this agenda, which means giving up power, basically. It means governments have a lot less power, people have a lot more power. What government wants to do that? <clears throat> well, you do it through the creation of political community at the national level. And a really great example of this is what was called big organizing that was the organizing principle behind the Bernie Sanders campaign to become the Democratic nominee. Now, Sanders started off from not a great place in American politics. He had 3% name recognition, and he had no money, which is a little bit fatal if you want to be president of the United States. So he sits down with his two or three advisors and say, well, what are we going to do? How on earth are we going to launch this bid? Everyone says I'm an irrelevant dinosaur, and if anybody's heard of me at all. Uh, what have we got? What resources do we, got, uh, do we have? And someone said, well, 
The only resource we've got, really, is the enthusiasm of people who want you to be president. And that's a big resource, because the, 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 those people who want you to be president really, really want you to be president. So what if, instead of trying to get lots of money, which is going to be very hard for us, because unlike a certain other person, we're not going to be owned by Goldman Sachs, um, what if we, um, um, instead of trying to hire a great big expensive staff, asked volunteers to do some of the work which staff would normally do. Oh, that's a bit scary. Well, volunteers, amateurs, just sort of do these sort of core political tasks, organizing tasks. Well, we, okay, we're given something small, you know. So, okay, you guys who really want um, Bernie to be president, uh, could you organize a meeting? <laughs> Bit my hand off, blimey. They're keen. Yeah, yeah, we organize a meeting. And they organize a fantastic meeting. Blimey, how did they do that? And, they've, and there's this, you know, they, there's this tech-savvy young guy who's, who's got this app, which we never heard of, and he's used it to organize this part of the meeting, and, oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, could you guys organize a phone bank? <laughs> bit, bit my other hand off. It's like, well, wow, they, they really... And what they've quickly discovered is the more you ask people to do, the more people want to do. They, they, they become much more enthusiastic. If you say to them, oh, could you put some pamphlets in envelopes? They say, all right, well, I suppose it helps. But if you say, could you do something really big, like basically organizing the whole campaign? They say, yeah, yeah, me, 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 me. I want to do it. I want to do it. Because we all want to feel useful. We all want to have a sense of meaning and purpose. That's what so many of us desperately crave. And here's a campaign saying, you can do the whole lot except the media operation, which we're keeping in-house. That was the only thing they kept in-house. Everything else they delegated out. And to begin with, they said, well, you know, we've got a problem. We're going to have to train all these people. And they trained the first wave of volunteers, and it's quite time-consuming and stuff. And then, oh my gosh, there's all these people coming forward and need training. And the first wave of volunteers said, why do you want to train them? We can train them, because we've already been trained. So the first wave trains the second wave, the second wave trains the third wave, and suddenly you've got this proliferating political community which takes its cues from the centre but operates almost autonomously and just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as these waves of volunteers expand. And these are people embedded within the communities they're trying to reach. They're not outsiders turning up with clipboards saying, how do you intend to vote, sir? These are people who say, your pain is my pain, mate, because I'm feeling exactly the same as you are. They did this to me as well. And that's so much more powerful. And tragically, they only really discovered this model within the last few weeks of the nomination bid. But when they did, Sanders's vote just went vroom like this. It was quite extraordinary. By, by the end of the nomination process, they had 100,000 volunteers who had organized 100,000 meetings and spoken directly to 75 million voters. They reckoned with another four weeks, they would have spoken to every accessible adult in America. And then I think they would have swept past Hillary and swept past Trump as well. I don't think he would have stood a chance because they were building a sort of institutional revolution. Well, I read a book by two of Sanders' organizers, coming very close to the end here, um, called Rules for Revolutionaries. Uh, this is how we did it. And, um, and I thought, oh, this is pretty inspiring. And soon after I read it, Theresa May announced the election in, in, in the UK. And uh, the only argument um, among my colleagues in The Guardian and most of the other cognoscenti was, are the Conservatives going to win a 100-seat majority or a 120-seat majority? Everybody accepted that Labour was just going to be wiped out and would never be seen again because the poll ratings were so appalling. But I've read this thing and thought, well... Why can't we do something like this over here? So I made a video for The Guardian saying, look, if, if Corbyn's Labour Party did something like this, brought over some of the Sanders organisers and got this big grassroots machine out there taking over political roles, it might just stand a chance. And, and you know how you should never look at the comments below the line when you do an article or a video? Well, I have this sort of fatal attraction. I can't stop looking. And, and it was like, oh, my God. God, there literally was not a single positive comment about the kindest thing was Monbiot's really gone and looped the loop this time. 
Um, and everyone thought I was completely insane. And I was like, oh, no, cool, that wishful thinking. I really wish I hadn't made that video. What an idiot. I mean, I still feel this cringe about it, despite what then happened. Little did I know, and this had nothing to do with me, as I was making the video, on that very day, two of Sanders' organisers were landing in Britain at Labour Party's invitation to teach them how to do it. And the rest is history. The biggest political surprise in British democratic history, Torbyn's Labour deprived the Conservatives of their majority. And this is still in its infancy. There's loads more stuff being developed as, as we speak, and some of it looks very exciting, but there's a lot more to learn about this technique. Now, it is my contention that if we can marry big organising with a powerful new restoration story that tells us who we are, where we are, that lights a path to a better world, then, my friends, we become unstoppable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring talk. Um, before we start, I'm going to give you some water. Thank you. I would like to start actually um, a bit where it all started with you. You are a, a biologist from origin. You studied at um, Oxford University. Um, and I was wondering how are you, how do you reflect on the current relationship between uh, human and uh, the natural environment that they're living in? Uh, well, it's broken, I suppose. <laughs> um, um, we, um, uh, it's not just that we are inflicting terrible harm on the rest of the living world, and I call it the living world because environment creates no pictures in the, in the mind. I mean, I'm just trying to change the language. It's why mm -hmm. I say climate breakdown, not climate change. Mm -hmm. it's calling it climate change is like calling an invading army unexpected visitors. Such a ridiculously neutral and passive term for this existential crisis mm -hmm. we, we, we face. Um, and so um, um, the living world um, is something which you know, we have regarded in purely instrumental terms as something we can exploit and make wealth from. Um, even um, the, when many people in society see it as a great source of wonder, it takes only a few people to kill the elephants and the rhinos and to cut down the forests mm -hmm. and the rest of it. And so obviously we need major restraint on those people. But the, the double tragedy is our own detachment from it and our loss of contact, our alienation from the living world. And it's one aspect of the alienation that is ripping us apart. Um, I, I watched uh, a talk show yesterday mm -hmm. where uh, a young boy of nine years old mm -hmm. said, why should I go outside to play hide and seek? Mm -hmm. Well, I can also play hide and seek on my phone and on my phone it's never raining. Yeah. And I was quite shocked by that, yes. actually. Well, but um, what do we lose? Mm. What exactly do we lose if we... Well, we, we lose a great deal. I, I mean, it's not just, you know, all the obvious things like losing experience, losing texture, losing um, um, understanding. But we also lose a very uh, a crucial aspect of social contact. This is, again, you and, and me doing the album did a lot of research on this and uh, we ended up writing a song called The Child Inside because we realized that the indoor life is a, is a formula for loneliness and that when kids are playing outside without adult supervision, they learn really good social skills because mm -hmm. they have to solve their own problems. You know, you get in a fight, you have to resolve that fight without your mum or dad coming and saying, no, don't be so stupid, you bad people, you know, do this and mm -hmm. that. You've got to work it out for yourselves. You fall out of a tree, you, as a group of friends, have got to sort out the fact that someone's fallen out of a tree. You know, you, you, you've, got, you've got to figure this out, and you learn really good social skills, and you develop really good social bonds. Far more so, even if you're interacting with people via your PlayStation or your phone or something, you, you don't develop those same bonds. So, but you know, what the, the, do you expect of this generation, then? 
of this younger generation that is growing up behind mm. the screens without mm. any social contact, without learning any social skills. I think it's very frightening. I mean, I, I, we, the figures are showing us a massive spike in mental health disorders um, amongst um, teenagers um, and, and, and people in their 20s. Um, it's where it's peaking now <clears throat> with um, some really horrendous dis um, um, figures on, for instance, self-harm. It's very, very high among teenagers and young women. One study showed it rising fourfold in 10 years. Now, there are various factors behind this, but I do think the, the, so, uh, the social media and being locked on your phone and things is bound to have something to do with it. I mean, you, the, social media is double-edged. It can bring people together, but it can also set them apart. It's a very powerful mm -hmm. tool for social comparison. Well, how come they've got more followers than me? How come they've got more likes than me? What have they got that I haven't? I mean, you even have these beauty settings on your phone which change your image as you take the photo and make you look beautiful. It doesn't seem to work on my phone. I need to take it back to the shop. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and so you compare yourself to your own image. You look in the mirror and think, oh, I thought I looked nice, but I don't. You know, and, 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 and so this, this is, I think, very disruptive and it mm -hmm. creates envy, it, it, it cre creates um, um, status anxiety, mm -hmm. um, and all this is joined with the isolation, with the loneliness, mm -hmm. which is so damaging. What's amazing to me is that all children don't have me mental health disorders. Yeah, exactly. Um, and um, uh, if we're looking at this uh, living world, you are speaking about um, a human being that is not solely individual, not, not solely competitive. Um, but what kind of proof do you see that this is not the case? What kind of, and, and do you see any relationships with uh, animals, for example, or what are the differences? Well, well the interesting thing was, um, and again, this actually was for the, I mean, you and I did a lot of research. I mean, we kind of over-researched an album. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to put a lot of research in it, but we were so fascinated by this subject. I mean, the reason it came about was that um, I'd written an article in The Guardian about what I call the age of loneliness in response to research findings showing the long list of diseases which are exacerbated by chronic loneliness. It turns out that chronic loneliness is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of your physical health, mm. twice as bad as obesity, massively shortens your life. I mean, this is really scary stuff. And so I wrote this up and it went super viral, massive sensation around the world. And I have various publishers came to me and said, hey, this is great, will you write a book about it? I thought, right, three years sitting on my backside writing a book about loneliness. <laughs> What's the second prize? <laughs> and, and then I thought, well, I want to do something about this because people are obviously really interested. And then, of course, music, that's what brings people together. Mm -hmm. And so it got together with Ewan and we, um, and, and we wanted to find out, you know, why is it that loneliness hurts us so much? And what we ended up doing was an exploration into human nature. We, and we just couldn't stop because it was so interesting. So, so uh, and what we discovered was this you know, thing about us being the most sociable of mammals, with the exception of the possible exception of the naked mole rat. Um, and, and that all these things which we're told about ourselves, that we're homo economicus, pursuing our self-interest, our primary values of selfishness and greed and competitiveness, was just completely untrue. We came across this lovely article in a psychology journal, um, a review article, looking at all the evidence on this question. And it said, homo economicus is an excellent description of chimpanzees. Mm. Basically, if you're a stranger chimpanzee and you turn up um, a, a, to a troop of chimpanzees and say, hi guys, can I join you? You're highly likely to get your arm ripped off. Okay, now we're in a group of people who are mostly probably strangers to each other. Um, anyone had their arm ripped off? If, if so, could your neighbor please hold your hand up? <laughs> You see, I mean, we're just not like that. It's quite remarkable mm -hmm. how we're not like that. I mean, you know, any other animal where you pack a load of strangers together for the first time, they're going to start ripping each other to bits. Mm -hmm. We don't do this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, so, and we um, read in social psychology, in um, neurobiology, in anthropology, in evolutionary biology, and they were all coming to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. A massive bank of experimental mm -hmm. evidence showing that while we've all got some selfishness, some greed, some competitiveness in us, our primary values, so you our would... community feeling, altruism, empathy, mm -hmm. 
um, kindness towards others. So you would say that um, we could, um, uh, Hobbes, for example, always said like uh, we humans are completely individual. If we don't have a state uh, that is ruling us, uh, we will be in a war of all against all. Mm -hmm. um, so you you would say that this is not the case anymore, or or no, no, it's never been the case. I mean, you could forgive Hobbes for his assumptions. He had just witnessed the devastations of the English Civil War. About a tenth of the men in Britain were killed in that war. He believed in the doctrine of original sin. His concept of evolution was confined to mm -hmm. the book of Genesis. I mean, in 1651, it was an entirely understandable belief system. But in still, when I'm, when I'm on is, Twitter, for example, mm. sometimes it really looks like a war of all against yeah, all. Sure. Well, uh, A, Twitter is not representative no. of society, however much it might claim to be. B, there's some very interesting work showing that the sort of people who engage in that um, sort of uh, nasty behavior on social media are a very particular Mm -hmm. um, kind of person mm -hmm. who are really not typical. But uh, we do, I mean, it's true, our perceptions are distorted. And they're distorted, I think, by three factors. One is that we have um, a survival instinct to look out for danger. And so we emphasize in our minds the bad things that people do rather than the good things. So, mm -hmm. for instance, on, on the train um, to Rotterdam today from, um, where was I? Uh, Brussels, yes. Um, well, what day is it? I must, it must be either Brussels or Antwerp or Rotterdam or Amsterdam, right? Um, it, because it's Saturday. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, they, uh, there was a pickpocket, uh, well, a, a, a bag snatcher. He, he snatched someone's bag mm -hmm. and the guy ran after him and there was a scuffle and then he let go of the bag and the guy got his bag back. It was really exciting because I've scarcely ever witnessed this happening. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it was like, whoa, wow, I'm going to tell my partner all about that. Um, because, uh, you know, but I'm not going to tell her about the fact that um, somebody gave up their seat for an elderly person mm. and somebody helped someone else with, mm. with, with their bag onto the train and mm -hmm. somebody stood aside to let somebody else get on the train before yeah. them because that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So much that we don't even notice it. But boy, that really stuck in the mind, this, yeah. this nasty big um, shaven-headed man snatching someone's bag. Oh, but you know, that is so atypical. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, but, but it becomes very large in our mind. And of course the news media, this is the second factor, exacerbates that exactly. because if it bleeds, it leads. The yeah. news is all about the bad things mm -hmm. that people do to each other mm -hmm. because the good things are so commonplace that they're boring. Mm -hmm. And then the third factor is this thing that those who claim to lead us do not share our values on the whole. Some do. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't generalize about everyone. I'm sure there are one or two wonderful politicians in the audience, but, mm -hmm. but the, uh, <laughs> who are highly atypical politicians, but highly typical human <laughs> beings. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is remarkable how many Donald Trumps there are, or Boris Johnsons, or the Render Modi's, mm -hmm. or, or Jair Bolsonaro's out there who yeah. are governing societies um, who, whose values they do not share. Yeah, speaking about this, um, um, we see populism and nationalism are on the rise in the UK, in Hungary, in Poland. Um, um, how does all of this stand in the way of you trying to convey your story? Mm. Well, it certainly doesn't help. <laughs> and maybe but, it makes your story even more urgent, right? Well, it does. It does. Because basically, you know, they are filling a vacuum. This stuff yeah. isn't happening by accident. Sure. You know, they are highly organized. They've got, there is a sort of, they've got a kind of demagogic international functioning where there's huge amounts of money from the Koch brothers, from Robert Mercer, from other um, really sinister billionaires who are um, pumping money into this kind of political organizing. But it wouldn't have any traction if people hadn't, didn't feel that politics had failed them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they turn away from politics because it's not delivering for them. So we have to make politics deliver and that means a completely different politics mm -hmm. to the politics that we've been used to over the past 20 or 30 years. And I think, um, uh, I'm wondering what you think about it, but should we also, because the, the populist rhetorics are super attractive nowadays. Everyone is, is looking for an attractive story, which uh, they are offering at the moment. Um, do you think we should adopt some of those populist rhetorics in order to um, uh, attract people to, those, to this new story? 
Well, I mean, it depends what you mean by populist rhetoric. If you mean fake news, then no. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have to base this in reality. But we've got a great story to tell. Yeah. And what they are good at is storytelling. Yeah, exactly. You know, this whole Make America Great Again story. I mean, it's very yeah. much a restoration story that yeah. Trump has been proposing and you know he might be a, a, a complete tosser but he you know he, he sticks to the story and he understands the mm -hmm. power of narrative even though he doesn't tell it particularly well mm -hmm. he repeats it and repeats exactly. it and repeats it because he's got nothing else to say um, and 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 that is highly effective so yeah absolutely we have to do that but mm -hmm. telling this completely different mm -hmm. story which is actually grounded on demonstrable fact mm -hmm. and um, when I was reading your book I thought where where should we all start? Should uh, politics follow the changes um, happening in society or should politicians take the lead in order to create policies in which uh, uh, community building is striving? Well, I mean, we have to, uh, you know, those five things I was talking about, yeah. they, uh, there's no reason why we can't do them all simultaneously, not the same people doing them. I mean, the other thing I like about this approach, and it's by, you know, uh, the great thing is it's by no means, you know, just me proposing this. There's a great convergence of thinking around this a radical devolution to communities, rebuilding the commons and the rest of it. A lot of thinkers are moving in this direction at the moment. It's very exciting to see this happening. It does feel like the beginning of something very big. And the lovely thing I like about the approach is that people who want to join in can join in in a hundred different ways uh, choosing the way that suits them best. They might be a, a great cook and, and, mm -hmm. and are able to bring people together around cooking and eating. Mm -hmm. They might be um, a very brave person who's prepared to lie in a motorway with their arm in a concrete tube. Well, that's not for everyone. Um, they might be someone who's really good at um, digital technology and can help with creating participatory democracy. Mm -hmm. They might be uh, someone who's really great at organizing meetings and can help with big organizing. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many ways into this which um, attract so many different skill sets. So mm -hmm. there's kind of something for everyone. So we need everyone here. from all different perspectives. That operating at all sorts of different... And instead of having this sort of, you know, the, 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 the sort of social democratic model was very much a centralized party structure which instructs you, the foot soldiers, what to do yeah. in, 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 um, in order to carry carry out this big central plan. And that's really boring. Uh, it's really, really boring for most people, but it also um, leads immediately to the accumulation of power. Mm -hmm by that central structure, which Speaking then Speaking about the accumulation of power, um, because oh, I was quite confused reading your book, which is um, uh, mainly focused on citizen initiative and policy initiatives. But I was thinking all the time, what about those big companies that mm. in my perspective actually hold more power sometimes mm. uh, than our governments? Mm. What is your take on this? Oh, you, well, I mean, it's, it's critical that we curtail them. And I mean, they've been massively empowered by neoliberalism, which says don't interfere, let them do what they want, because what they want is going to be good for us by some sort of magic. You know, mm -hmm. it's fairy dust, the invisible hand. I mean, it really is. The invisible hand is like the flying spaghetti monster. It's this, it's this sort <laughs> of this, this, this god they've got, which is just going to magically sort everything out. And it's crazy. But, but um, so we absolutely we need that regulation. We need that taxation yeah. to curtail them. We need to make them subject to democracy. We need to charge them for privileges such as limited liability. Exactly. Why are we giving them limited liability? Why aren't we charging them for it like an insurance scheme? And who, who would be the main actor that, that should um, try to deal with this? Because um, I sometimes think that the EU might be the only... Uh, a big structure that could really do something about those multinational corporations? Well, I mean, it should do, and it is, you know, it's the only structure of um, major regional governance that we've got anywhere on Earth which is in any way remotely functional, you know, has, has got any democratic component. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's highly susceptible to corporate lobbyists who put huge resources mm. into getting what they want. And you know, the Brexit vote in Britain, uh, there are all sorts of reasons behind it, but, you know, though I voted Remain, I could see that in some respects they had a point. Mm -hmm. That, you know, when you've got these enormous lobbying machines, politics can feel very remote and feel like you've got very little traction at that level, um, especially when 
the European Commission starts trying to negotiate TTIP, you know, this huge mm -hmm. trade treaty which was uh, so much against people's interests. Mm -hmm. And you know, we knew this. And, 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 and in some, you know, there are some fundamentally wrong things about the European mm -hmm. Union, even though in general it is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And we need democratic global governance because mm -hmm. at the moment we've got undemocratic global governance exactly. in, in every respect. So, mm -hmm. so, um, <clears throat> um, but, but. Uh, in its current state, I don't see the EU being a powerful force for confronting corporate power because, to a large extent, it is controlled by corporate power. Mm -hmm. That could theoretically change, but for that to change, so how we, we, need, try to well, change we need the grassroots revolution. I mean, mm -hmm. we can't wait for anyone in a position mm -hmm. of power to start giving up that power yeah. and to stop having lunches with um, the very fine lunches and very fine wine with Monsanto and Exxon and um, the farmers unions or whoever <laughs> else is, is lobbying mm -hmm. them um, to stand up against them unless they are much more frightened of us than they are of them. Mm -hmm. And we have to make them afraid that they're going to lose their positions mm -hmm. um, if they, they don't reflect the will of the people. Mm -hmm. And so we have to demonstrate that will. And speaking about uh, uh, a revolution, yesterday I read an article in The Guardian um, with the following headline. Uh, we have a duty to act. Hundreds ready to go to jail over climate crisis. The group that had sent a letter to uh, The Guardian uh, said that the social contract, speaking of Hobbes again, uh, the social contract had been broken uh, and it is therefore not only our right but our moral duty to bypass the government's inaction and to rebel to defend life itself. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these kind of statements? Should yeah. we really abolish the law and um, go uh, onto the streets? And oh, no, no, they're not talking demand. about abolishing the law. I'm, I'm speaking But at they're the... ready to go to jail. Oh, yeah, no, that's not the same as abolishing the law at no. all. <laughs> But... I fought the law and the law won. <laughs> um, the... Um, um, uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be there at the launch of, of the, and speaking actually at the l launch of their action on Wednesday, um, you know, the beginning of this yeah. really big thing. It's great. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very much in favour of it. And these are people who recognise the law and recognise that some laws are just, not all of them, um, recognise that what they do will quite likely lead to arrest and imprisonment. It's civil disobedience, non-violent, peaceful, but, but, civil but disruptive um, mm -hmm. stuff, which is intending to mm -hmm. yeah, defend us against extinction, defend the rest of the living planet mm -hmm. against extinction, uh, extinction, confront environmental breakdown, and, um, and, and to say we take responsibility for what we're doing and, yeah, sure, throw us in jail. And it's not until you demonstrate that you believe in what you're doing to the extent that you're prepared to make such a sacrifice that you really start to build a mass movement. Mm -hmm. And the more people go to jail, the more people are going to join the movement. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. There were, uh, for the first time since um, 1992, um, uh, three people were jailed um, a couple of months ago for protesting against fracking mm. in the UK. The first environmental protesters jailed since 1992. But the what result, did they do? They only, they only protest? They sat, on they sat on top of a lorry. That was it. And they, got three, they got 16 months in jail from a judge who's got family interests in oil and gas, which he yeah. did not disclose, and he did not, against the law, the judge broke the law by not recusing himself mm -hmm. from, from, from presiding over the trial. Mm -hmm. It went to appeal, and they immediately got mm -hmm. released, and the appeal court would say, why the hell were these people thrown in prison? Mm -hmm. But the result of them going to prison was a vast increase in the number exactly. of people sitting on top of lorries. Yeah. Do, you also <laughs> do you also think that those kind of movements can spread throughout the, uh, throughout the European Union? Or oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, in some ways, in, in the UK, we're behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's exciting that it's happening in the UK because we've been so bad at this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've done so little of it. In many other parts yeah. of the world, you know, people are very bravely putting themselves on the line all the time. If you look I mean, at the, um, uh, the US, for example, at this yeah, moment. And... Or Brazil. Mm -hmm. Or, in fact, the whole Latin America, the killings of environmental activists. Mm -hmm. It's just shocking numbers. Mm -hmm. But people keep stepping up to do this. And, mm -hmm. and it's time we stepped up. And before we go uh, to the audience, I wanted to address one more uh, issue, and that is actually the role of culture, um, because I believe that cultural expressions are really important in creating change, in creating new narratives as well. And um, how do you see the role of culture? What could 
cu culture mean in your uh, new narrative? Uh, well, uh, of course, it depend depends uh, how we um, define culture. Uh, I mean, do you mean high culture? Do you mean theatre? I mean, actually, mean all kinds of culture. I spoke mm. to a professor uh, mm. at European mm. Studies this Wednesday, and he wrote uh, two uh, big um, encyclopedias um, in of more than four kilo in total with cultural expressions mm. that cause nationalism in Europe. Right. Um, right. Uh, in his perspective. Right. And he also told me, like, we could have um, uh, foreseen Brexit happening while looking at the enormous popularity of series such as Downton Abbey. And actually, that was quite eye-opening for me, and very I was wondering what you think about it. Oh, yeah. Well, this is cru crucially important. In fact, there's a very interesting study in the journal Cyber Psychology um, showing that... Um, uh, showing the um, incredible values shift in children's television over the course of 20 years, going from uh, expressing values which are the common human values of kindness and community feeling and all the rest of it, to when you get to Hannah Montana, it's just all about fame. It's all about self-enhancement. Mm. It's completely flipped, mm. and they're showing and, and, and show that the way kids are responding is they're absorbing these values. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, the media in particular has got an awful lot to answer for in this story. And most mm -hmm. of the media is owned by billionaires, you know, and they're not going to use it for our benefit, they use it for their benefit. Mm -hmm. They give us a completely distorted picture of the mm -hmm. world in drama as well as in politics, mm -hmm. in news reporting. And could you also use um, uh, culture to tell your own story? Because you uh, made a, an album already, you wrote several books. Can we expect to film somewhere in yeah. the future? That might well, mean something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to use any medium that'll have me. At the moment in the UK, it's just trying to get any purchase with broadcasters is just mm -hmm. impossible. They're so hostile to mm -hmm. these ideas. I mean, they're always 10 years behind the curve, mm -hmm. but it's just extremely frustrating. I mean, mm -hmm. it's better in the rest of Europe, but in the UK, it's just a really, really difficult media environment to so operate So we should in. actually create a community which can make the film. Absolutely. Films. And so I'm doing community videos, which I'm finding so much more satisfying than trying to get anywhere with the BBC, which is mm -hmm. hopeless. All right. Um, I'm looking into our audience. Are there any questions? And I say questions, not statements, uh, from your site. Um, could we? Uh, could I just say, say Anne and Marine? Could we go, woman, man, woman, man? And if anyone identifies as non-binary, put the hand up at any time. Yes. Otherwise, we all know what happens, don't we, gentlemen? I start. <laughs> I start with a woman here in the front. Sorry, mag ik er even langs? Can I say my name? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Martijntje Smit. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk at first. But you surprised me telling about these uh, plot lines, uh, repeating, but then uh, every time we had another hero and another kind of disorder. And somehow I expected that you would really change the plot line, not just the hero and the uh, type of disorder. Mm -hmm. So what guarantees that the same kind of plot line will help us and is isn't the answer you in fact give by pointing at the commons and the small politics as a power, so to say, yeah. isn't that maybe just a really different story than the... Well, that's well, my question. Uh, well, I, I would in, just... In, in the way sure. you plot it. Sure. I mean, I would distinguish between narrative structure and what you use the narrative for, which are two very different things. So, you know, this exact plot line has been used for fascism and has been used for communism. It's been used for social democracy, it's been used for neoliberalism. You can use it in a thousand ways. But if it is true that there is a very limited number of basic plots, which I think is true, you know, there's a lot of work being, being done on this, um, then are we going to invent a whole new plot alongside all the other things we have to do? I mean, isn't life difficult enough already? Wait, wait a second. Maybe you agree that in uh, the communist plot line and in the neoliberal plot line is very much a utopian and a dystopian way of thinking, which in, to my mind is a secular form of the, well, like, uh, for example, a Christian way of seeing heaven and hell, etc. Mm -hmm. And it's my intuition that we need to get rid of this utopian and dystopian narratives mm -hmm because they somehow deny the human agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Um, I, I mean, I, I, I see exactly where you're coming from, but I guess what I'm interested in is in what works. And, you know, looking at how I can't think of a single effective transformation in politics or religion which has not used this narrative structure. So do we say to ourselves, well, we don't like the narrative structure, so let's try to do it without using it. Let's try not only to do this huge long list of wonderful things we want to do, but to do it against the grain of everything we've learned from other transformations. Well, you know, we don't have a lot of time here. You know, it would be lovely to see if there's a way of doing it in a completely different way, but you know, I just want to, I'm interested in what has been shown to work. And actually, you know, it, it's not that, it doesn't lead to conclusion, a particular conclusion, because it can be used in such radically different ways. It's just a way of how you tell the story. It's not what the story is about. It's not who the characters within the story are and what they do. It's a question of what the basic structure of the storytelling is. It's how you explain what you're doing to other people. And it doesn't determine the, um, the, 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 how the story actually unfolds in reality because, of course, what I want to do is sow the seeds which grow a thousand different flowers and, 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 and they bloom in a thousand different ways and who knows what's going to happen. You know, my, my great ecological interest is in rewilding which is about saying you just create the right conditions and then let nature do all the rest. It's my anarchist tendencies. I feel very much the same when it comes to human politics. We create the right conditions and then let go and see what happens and amazing things happen which no one would have predicted, like they found with the big organizing model, like um, they found with so much participatory culture. These unpredictable, emergent, wonderful things happen but, you know, the, the plot line doesn't force people into line. It doesn't say you have to follow this. It's our way of explaining what we want to do, which creates a picture in people's minds and shows them that there is hope when they didn't think there was hope before. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I was wondering, seeing that you said we need um, sort of democratic, uh, what was it? change in the regime. Um, yet at the same time, we see time and again how governments these days tend to ignore public opinions when it doesn't really suit their policies. Um, would you say to, at what point would you say that neoliberalism as a system is ironically too big to fail? Yeah, well, it's, it's of course, um, you know, what we're seeing is that everything, once it acquires its institutional power, at least claims for itself that it is too big to fail. Um, I mean, I don't think neoliberalism is too big to fail. I don't think any political system is. I mean, think of some of the totalitarian systems which looked unbreakable. It looked impossible to overthrow them, and then suddenly they fell apart. Um, this, you know, politics, no politics lasts forever. Even if we come up with a fantastic story, a fantastic idea, it will have a, a, a lifetime, and it will come to the end of its life at some point, and then someone will have to come up with a new way of, of, of telling the, the restoration story and new elements within that story in order to inspire a new generation of political activists to um, um, change the world for the better. Um, but, you know, because those crucial elements weren't in place when we could have hit neoliberalism the first time and overthrown it, and they're still not really in place, so they are developing for when the next crisis happens, which might not be very long um, at all. Um, looking at the indebtedness in Italy and other, other places at the moment, um, uh, we, we were unable to engineer the anticipated death of neoliberalism. But we can, we can do it if, if the right elements are there. It's, it looks terrifyingly powerful. But every political system, dominant political system, looks terrifyingly powerful until suddenly it isn't. Mm -hmm. Hi. Why uh, didn't what happened in Porto Alegre uh, spread to the rest of Brazil? Mm. Well, uh, to, to some, thank you. Now, another excellent question. They're all great questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, to some extent it did. Um, quite a few Brazilian cities picked it up, but you did need a sympathetic PT government, um, municipal government, to, to actually make it happen. You couldn't do it 
in places which were governed by, by the far right, and quite a lot of cities in Brazil, hard right, far right um, governments, but it, it spread quite a lot. Um, it spread to other countries as well. Um, I, I don't know about in the Netherlands. Are, are there, does Amsterdam have a participatory system of any kind? I mean, quite a few cities now have a little tiny bit of participatory mm -hmm. budgeting, just a tiny element of the budget, but, you know, the councils don't want to let go too much or are a little bit scared by it. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's got tremendous potential to take off, and we just have to be a lot braver in demanding that we get this. We have to be a lot more focused. We have to recognise the incredible change which it can bring about. And, um, uh, sorry, I have one question in the meantime. Um, we, you mentioned uh, Reykjavik as a good example. We spoke about Porto Alegre. Um, but, but do you have any other um, fantastic examples mm -hmm. um, that you would tell to us or share yes. with us? Well, perhaps um, the most remarkable one, though it's under horrendous pressure and gets attacked by uh, both the um, Turkish government and the Syrian government, is the Kurdish enclave of Rojava in northern Syria, um, which um, uh, is or was run on entirely participatory lines, with village assemblies being the primary political unit to which other units defer. And, and basically, uh, the assemblies um, um, deliver their um, decisions up through the sort of state and federal structure within Rojava. Um, it's controlled from the bottom up. Women uh, played the primary role in politics. Um, it was very much um, built around the ideas of, uh, of uh, Abdul, uh, Ab 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 Abdullah Ocalan, which in turn were built on the ideas of the American eco-anarchist Murray Bookchin. And it um, is or was a really amazing experiment with remarkable results under mm -hmm. tremendous pressure but you know when you've got turkey and syria bombing the hell out of you it's really difficult to sustain mm -hmm. it yeah exactly i have another question yes so um tonight and throughout the whole weekend there's a great number of really amazing people occupying a brown coal mine in germany yes to yes. save what's left of, of a forest and so i wanted to go back to activism and civil disobedience and i wanted to more specifically ask what would be the the role of activism and how do you see that fit into the, the narrative and the different elements that you discussed? Well, I think it's absolutely essential. And, and, you know, the thing is, this isn't a question of saying we've got to do this rather than that. We've got to do it all. And that's the lovely thing about it. You know, there's so many different ways in which we can operate and be effective. And activism, uh, especially this non-violent civil disobedience of the kind um, um, we're seeing wonderfully in Germany at the moment, has got several crucial uh, elements to it in that a, a, a demonstration has two meanings. You're demonstrating against something, but you're also demonstrating something. You are showing people something. You are uh, illustrating a point which people have missed. Here is this appalling thing. We're digging lignite out of the ground in 2018. The great green government of Angela Merkel is digging lignite out of the ground. By demonstrating against it, you are demonstrating what is going on. You're showing the whole country this crazy, crazy situation that is happening here at the government's behest. They cut down this 1,200-year-old forest in order to dig lignite out of the ground, the most polluting form of coal. This is absolutely bonkers. And so you draw attention to something which previously didn't receive enough, uh, 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 didn't receive enough attention. You show people and governments that you are deadly serious about opposing this. You're not just talking about it on Twitter. You're actually um, potentially sacrificing yourself. I mean, as we know, someone died in, in, in the Hambacher Forest um, trying to prevent the lignite mine from being dug. Um, you know, these are very, very brave people, and bravery is highly attractive. People flock towards bravery. They, mm -hmm. The heroism, the first cross of Amsterdam, you know, this is a really important value. I think we have time for uh, two more questions, and there is a lot of questions here in the back, so I will be staying here. For, <laughs> for okay, I'll keep it quick. Uh, what about power? So power, it, power is 
incredibly well organized. Power sustains itself over the centuries. We, the reason we have a democracy is to balance the interests of the powerful with the rest of the people, yeah. uh, is how I, I kind of look at it. So how do we sustain this movement over time? Uh, power is really good at co-opting uh, yeah. new innovations like this. Well, of course, that's very true. I mean, everything, there's nothing which can't be corrupted. There's nothing which can't be captured. And what democracy depends on is eternal vigilance and constant challenge. Um, you know, even my you know, favorite party in the world, I wouldn't want them to take every seat in parliament because I, I want them to be challenged. But of course, they're never going to be sufficiently challenged just in parliament. The principal challenge has to be from below. So we have to constantly reinvent ourselves, constantly renew ourselves. Um, we need permanent revolution in, in a way where we're just challenging and challenging and challenging and preventing institutional power from putting down roots by putting down community roots of our own which um, distribute and disperse power among the population. Now, you know, what I've proposed today is not a formula for getting it right forevermore. If we do this now, that's fixed it. By no means. You know, it, it, some things will be evidently wrong with it. Some things won't work. Some things um, will be um, um, e too easily challenged, too easily broken. Um, some things will go wrong. Some things might, might let in um, power-seeking, power-hungry people. So, you know, we challenge everything. We challenge these ideas, which is, you know, I love the challenges I'm getting from you right now. That's essential. Uh, we challenge each other. Um, we, we don't um, let anything become a doctrine. We don't sort of give anything biblical status. You know, one of the things which I find very depressing is when um, people say, well, it says here in this book such and such, therefore... You know, we can't deviate from this position. A lot of people use Das Kapital in this way. You know, this is what Marx said, therefore this has to be the policy. Oh, well, wait a minute. You know, Marx was a, a super clever man. He had a lot of really important things to say, but he wasn't the only one. And, and you know, we balance this with experience. We balance this with knowledge, and it's just permanent challenge is what we need. Everyone should be challenged, apart from me, obviously. <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, so in proposing this uh, new narrative or this new world by using imagination, uh, what about testing it vi with a visual language? Do, do you see a role here for artists or designers or architects? Massively so. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, another really important aspect. And thank you, thank you for that. raising it, because um, actually words only get you so far. You know, um, some people respond well to words. You're probably here because you're interested in words. You like words. But, you know, a lot of people, their minds operate in, in different ways. You know, we, one of the other amazing characteristics of human beings is we have highly diverse minds. And there's probably, again, good evolutionary reasons for this. Um, if you are a band of people um, living in the African savannas and you are uh, all thinking exactly the same, and you look at the world in exactly the same, your capacity for problem solving is much smaller than if you all look at it in different ways and are approaching what's around you in different ways and, 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 and have different problem solving approaches. Well, you know, we seem to have evolved to have highly diverse minds who, who, who see the world in different ways, solve problems in different ways, appeal to other people in different ways. And, and the visual aspect is absolutely crucial. Because visualization, actually, even within language, is critical. This is why, you know, I don't use the word environment because it doesn't create any pictures in the mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas natural world or living planet, that creates pictures in the mind. And we have to create pictures. Uh, people don't, inter uh, don't latch on to dry bureaucratic language without pictures. But, of course, the best picture is a picture. And, uh, and, and this comes back to your, your, your mm. question. Absolutely. We need all kinds of culture piling in on this. And, you know, a lot of the really interesting communities which have started are artistic communities, you know, which then proliferate into other mm. community forms of organization. Um, and, you know, we have got in this room, there are how many people? 150 people. There's 150 different talents here. And there's we can tap into those talents in a load of different ways. And the lovely thing about this highly disaggregated, 
highly devolved system that I'm talking about is we can use all of you and all those different skills. I, am, uh, I have just one last question to end with, and then uh, I invite you all to, uh, to come with us to the bar. Um, what can we do, what can I do uh, walking out of this room tonight, um, uh, what can I do tomorrow in order to start this movement, start this new narrative? Well, well what you can do is going to be very different from what you can do, or you, or you, because um, actually, I mean, I don't know you well enough to say what it is that Mm -hmm. you are best going to be able to do. You have to decide that for yourself. Um, and there are so many options here. But, you know, the, uh, again, you know, what's great about this, you don't have to ask anyone's permission. You don't have to go to a political party and say, can I pursue this way of organizing? Because actually, you know, when it comes to community organizing, this is something you can start. You can knock on your neighbor's door, someone mm -hmm. who might be sympathetic, and say, hey, how about if we organize this? And it might be at the community level, it might be at the political level, it might mm -hmm. be at the economic level, there's all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the strength of this comes from not from me saying you should do this, mm. it's from you waking up a little bit earlier than you normally wake up and lying there and thinking, oh, I can't get to sleep, and then, hey, wait a minute, I've had this great idea, mm -hmm. which fits with your experience, your psychology, your, 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 your own talents. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, and what, one of the things which I've really been noticing recently is that until a couple of years ago, I do talks like this, and I have a whole lot of people at the end say, well, why don't you do this, such and such? And I say, well, me? Well, I say, well, why don't you do it? <laughs> and they say, no, 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 you come on, you're the guy with the platform, you, you're the guy who's got to do it. I say, well, sorry, mate, I've got a full-time job already, thank you. Mm. And actually, I'm really crap at everything else. This is the only thing I'm good at. And, you know, uh, this, I can make my contribution this way, but I can't do this, but maybe you can, or maybe someone you know can, but I'm not getting that anymore. I think that's a really good sign. What I'm getting is people coming up to me afterwards and saying, can I tell you about this thing I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Which fits in with what you're talking exactly. about. Yeah. And we're seeing, I think, a resurgence of interest in actually taking back control mm -hmm. ourselves and, and, and changing the world from where we stand. And that's the only place from which we can change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story. And I hope that you will st share your story of tonight uh, with all your uh, friends and family at home. Um, thank you very much for being here with thank us you very tonight. Much for